Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, Journey to Machu Picchu in the Sacred Valley. Presented by NADHAB Expedition Leader, Rosa Alegria. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Over to you, Rosa. Rose, it looks like you're muted, I'm sorry to say. You're All right. back. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Um, it is a pleasure to join us. Uh, it's a pleasure to share with you the information I'm going to give you through the presentation um, for this trip to Machu Picchu and the Sacred Valley. My name is Rosa Alegria. Let me tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I am a, a, I'm a graduate from the University of uh, Cusco in a program, from the program of Tourism and Business Administration. And I've been working since 1985 uh, in the different regions uh, of uh, Peru, Ecuador, and Bolivia. I am a mountain guide and a jungle guide. I've been working for a long time in the jungle too, and uh, doing heavy trekking in some of the mountains of uh, Bolivia and Peru. Nowadays, uh, uh, since 1997, I'm working for Natural Habitat Adventures, as uh, running the different trips, you know, to especially to Machu Picchu and the Sacred Valley. Uh, so, what do we need to to come to Peru? Uh, in fact, you don't need a passport validated for six months. You don't even require a visa, no vaccinations, no papers. So this time, what you're really going to do is just simply come very well uh, dressed up with a very comfortable, very comfortable clothing. Like, for instance, this is what I show you, like a pair of comfortable pants with like a light hiking shoes, a long sleeve shirt a jacket, um, which could be actually just cotton, or it could be a fleece and a rain jacket, because we do have important things to tell you about the weather. Uh, well, besides that, we also have some um, accessories that you need to take. We have a deep pack with a water bottle, you know, a white ring hat, binoculars, and a camera, whichever you have. And if you have collapsible walking sticks, it will be, it will be great to have them especially for some of the long hikes, uh, which don't go more than one hour, one hour and a half. Um, let me tell you something about the weather. <laughs> I'm telling you the weather about Cusco, which is where Machu Picchu and the Sacred Valley is located. We have two main seasons. The dry season that runs from April to October with a temperature of 32 Fahrenheit to 67 and the rainy season, which is actually from uh, November to April, with a temperature that goes from 41 to 69 Fahrenheit. Uh, in order like uh, to, to get you into Peru, I have to show you, I have to share this map of South America. You see here, I have drawn with this red color to show you where is Peru. And there is the map of Peru. We have this interesting, you know, high relief drawing in order to show you this Andean range and the Andean range presence in Peru it is so vital uh, to the way how the different you know cultures have developed their uh, their uh, lives and how they have developed their social organization religion and the different kind of activities that they have developed afterwards well, first of all, let me tell you about the population. We have 33 million, 700,000 people. Our currency happens to be the Sol, El Sol. And uh, we do have different languages spoken you know, in this country. We have like a 48 different languages. Although most of them are spoken around, you know, the Amazon basin where most of the tribes are, uh, are living. Uh, although we have about 95% of the Peruvian population who speaks Spanish, and also the Quechua language, which is the Inca language. Aymar is another ancient language that is spoken around the high plateaus of Peru, which is this area, and of course, the Bolivian high plateau on this side. 
And uh, well, uh, I want to introduce you a little bit into what it is, uh, what's all about the free Inca societies. In order to understand uh, what the Inca civilization uh, was, we need to go through uh, the very beginning. And what's the beginning? The beginning is uh, with Huaca Prieta, which was actually a very old uh, culture. They started like a tool build these uh, pyramids. At the moment, it looks like a mound, but at one time it was a perfect pyramid uh, made out of stones and mortar. It goes back to 3,500 BC. You will wonder how far it goes back. If we think about 3,500 BC, you will probably think, oh, how about Egyptians, right? Sumerians, maybe Phoenicians, maybe uh, Mesopotamians, but also in Peru, there was these groups of people who decided to organize themselves in order to create and to build these pyramids. Interestingly, in these excavations that was done, they found a piece of a textile that was made out of cotton. Uh, this was actually a piece of a fishing net in which uh, textile, there was the decoration uh, out of a uh, yarn, obviously, of cotton uh, with a color of indigo, a blue indigo color that was very decorative, as you can see, this is a perfect condor design. And that was perhaps the first evidence of a uh, textilery that was actually practiced by these people. Uh, then we have another culture. In this case, we see this is Sechim Bajo, and it also goes 3,500 BC, but it's in a different place. It's still by the coast. They were building, by the way, this kind of ceremonial sunken, you know, circular temples open to the air, but right at the same area, we have Sechin Alto uh, that have developed 2000, between 2000 to 1500 BC. But look from what it was before to what they've done later on, like uh, low relief drawings of interesting personages who seems that they were uh, very terrifying personages who were playing the role of the capitators. You see this image, for instance, this uh, man in his right hand, he has uh, kind of like a whip, and on the right hand side, there's actually a, a head that is hanging down. And then, right after this, um, uh, this culture, we have a major civilization that had started on the northern part of Peru in a place called Caral. Caral is located in the Supe Valley, and it has it was actually developed 3,000 BC. When you, when you think about 3,000 years BC, that's actually really, really unbelievable because when you think about the Incas, where Machu Picchu is, is 1,200 after Jesus Christ, but Caral is 3,000 BC. So look at the kind of temples they have built. Again, circular, but this is much more massive. They have built actually about 46 different uh, pyramids. And part of this pyramid has actually got a little bit destroyed over here. This is being uh, restored through the last uh, 40 years. And they managed to find out this perfect circular sunken uh, temple, sort of like a, the kibas in the States for the Navajos of course, the Taos Pueblos. They also have practiced a very interesting ceramic. The ceramic was just raw, and they were actually uh, doing statuettes um, by uh, trying to show the stylish hairdos. Like this lady, look how she has this long hair. Uh, this man has like a short hair, but he has some kind of ornaments on the forehead. And we have the, this other statuettes also. The difference always, as with the hair. This was quite interesting for the yeah, for the lady archaeologist who found, and it was actually the beginning and the change and the transformation of our history, because this is an archaeological evidence that is telling you that we have life way before 
you know, uh, uh, way before the, 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 the European countries. This is Caral, 3000 BC. Then kind of like a, around in the area, northern part of the coast of Peru, we have Moche uh, civilization also. This time is 200 BC and then 200 after. Uh, in different periods, they actually had used kind of like a, the same valleys of the northern part of Peru, the coastal area. Now look at them. One pyramid was actually excavated. It was a, a kind of a whole real site. This personage using the original paraphernalia that was used for the funerary purposes. Take a look at this hairdressing, look at the thin necklaces, bracelets, you know, pectorals, and a kind of a tunic made out of gold and silver, little lamins, uh, was found in a, a, at the base of a pyramid. But uh, to get to the burials, uh, to the burial site, inside the burial site, we are, there was actually found all these uh, portraits made out of ceramic, which were given as offerings to this important personage whose name was uh, the Lord of Sipa. It is believed to be one of the most important uh, findings after the Tutankhamun burial site, the Lord of Sipa. Then we have uh, another culture, the culture of Lambayeque, developed between the years of 750 to uh, 1350, more or less. But this is the people who had actually uh, developed very important activity like uh, uh, metallur me metallurgy. Look at this, it's a very, uh, very regular uh, Peruvian symbolism especially when they want to tell you anything about the history, they will show up this figure, which is actually a ceremonial knife ornated with like a turquoise uh, uh, stones. You see the ear plaques here. You see this beautiful hairdress that looks like a, almost like a crown. It presents wings. If you see here, they have moon-shaped knife. So this is quite typical of this Lambayeque culture. We have here another mask. This, uh, this mask is very interesting. This is being found again in a burial site. Now look, this kind of a red stuff that it has on the mask. This happens to be cinnabar. Uh, that cinnabar decoration was actually used just in, only, in order to keep away any kind of enemies that it had so they wouldn't desecrate it. They wouldn't desecrate it because this, the, in, uh, to inhale the dust of this cinnabar will actually cause death. So the different kind of stories the people will do, this community will do, is like a, the spirit of the of the person that had become alive and I had killed him. In this case, this mask, being, uh, this mask was found in a burial site. You can actually tell that's made out of all, just like the same as it is this uh, uh, symbolism of the ceremonial knife. It's all in laments of gold. Again, it presents this ear plug. Uh, here we have another one, another important civilization, but this time it is not in the, uh, on the coast. This is right, we're already the heart of the mountain site. We, this is actually the mountain of Huascarán. It has about six, uh, it has about 22,000 feet about sea level. And there was this Javin civilization that have developed right at its, at its foot and they have built this incredible, you know, uh, temple, uh, which used to have different galleries. It even had, uh, it presented these kind of columns and inside this whole, uh, this whole mound, this whole uh, construction, it happens to be labyrinthic uh, passageways. And right in these passageways, we have monolithic, uh, uh, monolithic personages. Like a look, if you can distinguish in this low relief uh, carving, it presents canines, look at the eyes here, the hair actually are represented by snake, and also some heads that are sticking out from the uh, outside wall of these temples. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, head that it has this strange looking eyes. But notice what, we have, what he has in the nose. 
it's like a mucus running down. So what will happen such a thing? Just the same as this guy here, this head, it has like also some uh, closed nostrils, presents canines. So is this telling us that this person has have taken some uh, cactus, hallucinogenic beverages that it had uh, created this kind of a, this kind of a look, you know, this kind of uh, dilatating eye, uh, and then also the dilatating uh, nose. That's so much flame is coming out from it. Then we have again um, another civilization called Wadi. This was an empire uh, that Hoko was able to go all the way, not just to the south, to the central part of Peru, although to the northern part of Peru. Would you believe like a piece, uh, one of the ceramics that is to belong to this uh, Wadi civilization was found in Santa Cruz Island. And this is Galapagos Island. If you think about central Peru, like uh, going all over through the, the mountains and then the coast and then uh, use rafts and go towards the Santa Cruz Island. Sounds crazy. So these people were already exploring the ocean areas. So in this case, uh, in this case, we have also other uh, cities, uh, other temples, which are built in this uh by using, most of the time, very small rocks, as you see the ones here. This happens to be, this happens to be in Cusco. And uh, the name of the place is called Piquillata. And as you see, look how they have managed to do the planning. This is the whole street. And on the left hand side is basically kind of like a ruined city. But this is the idea of how back in the set hand towards the year thousand after Jesus Christ, they managed to plan, they managed to uh, build entire cities. Uh, right here you see uh, the construction of a, of a pyramid, again with the same kind of purposes. We have another civilization called Chimu that was actually developed, kind of like in the same areas as the previous uh, cultures that I told you about. In this case, it's Chimu, the 1400s after Jesus Christ. Look at the kind of decoration that they have in this temple. And this is all made in adobe bricks and with like a clay, with a, a lot of uh, uh, motifs uh, from the sea life. Uh, for instance, this is our, this uh, kind of like a rhomboidal figures are representing the um, uh, fishing nets, and there's like a, some different kind of birds. So, Chimu is almost parallel to the Incas. Why Chimu people were developing their lives uh, in the northern part of, co of the coast, and the south were the Incas. Uh, we're going to talk. Uh, we're going to touch that topic later on. And now, welcome. Welcome to Cusco. Cusco happens to be the capital city of the Inca civilization. And I have to I have to tell you about the period of the Incas. This is the 1200 to the 1532. The 1200, it doesn't mean that the Incas in the city of Cusco were the only ones. We actually had many other pre-Inca organizations who had uh, who have done different kind of also uh, constructions, uh, temples, but what the Incas have done was to to use uh, rocks just like this. Look at this stone, it has 12 angles, it happens to be one of the streets of Cusco City. And I have this image uh, to show you uh, what used to look like uh, an Inca king. This statue was made in memory to one of our greatest Inca kings, uh, whose name was Pachacute. And uh, he, he's the one who had actually transformed the social organization and the way how the uh, nation uh, started to expand um, by invasion, but also by alliances made with very, with some of the collapsing uh, societies like, for instance, Chimu, or like uh, uh, Wadi, or like uh, many other ones. Uh, so Pachacute was that uh, great, uh, emperor who have uh, changed uh, the way of life of the Cuscanians and is that's when 
the Incas finally figure out the way how to expand their country. That country was actually called um, the Huantinsuyo. Nowadays it's called Peru, but that Huantinsuyo was the original name of this country. Tawa, as you see here, Tawa meant poor. Inti meant sun. And suyo, suyo, sides. These Incas, they, had, they were very aware of the different geographical areas of their country. As you see here in this map, you see uh, the, this uh, green area was the northern coastal area. Uh, where most of the pre Inca societies that I have shown you before have uh, developed their, uh, their lives and with the name of Chinche Suyu. Then we had the Anti Suyu. You see the reddish part, and the geographical area is the cloud forest and the heart of the mountains, and a little bit of the high mountain jungle, too. And then we have another area which name is Hoya Suyu, and it happens to be around the Lake Titicaca. On the Peruvian side and also the Bolivian side. And then the other side, it was the Conti Suyu, which happens to be in the southern coastal part of Peru, where different kind of crops were, were grown. Whereas the Chinche Suyu was providing a lot of uh, dry seafood. And the Suyu was providing a lot of all these crops like uh, cocoa beans to make chocolate, like uh, coca leaves, to chew them because it was full of nutrients. Uh, from the Conti Suyo, a lot of corn, more corn of like uh, more than 2,200 different varieties. And then the areas of uh, the Hoya Suyo were actually um, uh, were, uh, producing so much of these varieties of potatoes, uh, obviously through the whole mountain range, over 5,000 different varieties of potatoes according to the International uh, Potato Center that happens to be located in Lima, Peru. As you see, this is um, this uh, whole territory that, they, that the Incas had superficially managed was about more or less five, uh, five million square kilometers. So there was a large territory that was covering Colombia all the way to Ancashmario, Ecuador, uh, Bolivia, Argentina, and Chile. Uh, so they had arrived, the Incas had arrived all the way to Quito in Ecuador, to Ancashmayo in Colombia, and then to Mendoza in Argentina, this called Catamarca, and to Santiago de Chile in, uh, in Chile, and all Bolivia. So you can tell the magnitude of this, uh, of the expansion of the Inca people, and that tells you how rich is the culture in this country. Before we continue, uh, let me just show you, let me just tell you a little bit about the itinerary, uh, this trip called Machu Picchu and the Secret Valley. Um, uh, we're going to start with the day one. You'll be arriving to Lima. Uh, as soon as you get to Lima, Getting into the airport, you're going to have to go through the uh, migration area where you're going to show your passport. Interestingly, they do not stamp anymore. All they do is like a, to just uh, get the information from your passport and that's it. Perhaps just to facilitate the traffic of people because there are so many uh, thousands of them, you know, going, trying to get into the country. So once you get through the migration area, you're going to go through uh, some souvenir uh, stores. Uh, eventually, the, the area where you're going to claim your luggage, as, um, as soon as you get your stuff, you just go out to the exit of the airport. Uh, and then, it's a natural habitat coordinator will be waiting for you with a net half sign. He will uh, immediately take you to the um, the hotel, which is just right across the right across the, the airport, and uh, it's going to give you the information to for the next day uh, of how you he, he will also assist you um, 
to the right in the airport in order like uh, to to come to Peru um, on day two. Excuse me. Again, I'm manipulating exactly where I want to go. And this is Cusco, day two. Uh, Cusco, uh, we have this airport. Um, this airport compared to the one in Lima is small. So this is where I'm going to be waiting for you to welcome you for this trip of Machu Picchu and the Sacred Valley. We're going to go through the city a little bit like the main square. This is the cathedral, by the way, for one of the churches uh, of the city. And then we're going to be coming into this region. Look at this map. This is the region of Cusco. This is actually a territory that has about 27,000 square miles. And this is where the city of Cusco happens to be. And we're going to be hanging out all around this area. This is where the Sacred Valley is. Uh, let me tell you some information about Cusco before we hit on the, on the real itinerary. Uh, the population of Cusco is 1,316,000 people. And uh, the Cusco, the Cusco city population is about 497,000 people. Right in this whole region, as you see the green area that happens to be the high mountain jungle, around this area is the cloud forest, and this is the mountainside. So eight different languages are spoken around here. Uh, Spanish is spoken by the majority, by the Quechua language, the Inca language is spoken by a by at least uh, 60, between 50 to 60 percent of the Cuscanian population. And there's also, also people who, come, who came from the high plateaus, the Lake Titicaca area, and then uh, even from, from Puno, who speaks the language of Aymara. Let me, uh, let me tell you a little bit, uh, let me tell you something in Quechua language. I, I just have welcomed you in Quechua language. This is a, a life a language, so there's no way to deny the existence of the cultural part of the Incas. So let me tell you a little bit about the altitude. The altitude in Cusco fluctuates between 10,500 to 11. Uh, 1,500. Um, now, uh, let's get into, into the itinerary. This is the map that NetHab is going to provide you. Um, and uh, it shows you a very detailed uh, map. This is Cusco City. Uh, we're going to get we're gonna get in a vehicle to go from Cusco towards Pisac, where uh, we're going to enjoy lunch. Let me just first of, all, first of all continue with this. From Pisa, we're going to be going to across Calca and Urubamba. And this little red point is where, is where the hotel is located. And next day, we're going to be hanging around this area in areas like Maras, Morai. And we're going to spend two nights here, and then go across Urubamba and go hit Ollantitambo, eventually to Machu Picchu, kind of like the day five. Much picture area is where you're going to spend another night. Doing the same train ride back to Ollantitambo. On a Ollantitambo in a vehicle, we're going to go back to Cusco and then uh, you'll spend one night in Cusco. And that's why this more or less the six days, five nights that we have in um, Cusco and Sacred Valley. This is what we have in Pisac. Before we hit Pisac, which is a colonial town, although it has a lot, it's a, it's a, a uh, Inca province, a very important archeolog uh, archeological site, we're gonna stop in a couple of spots. I want to show you some of the weaving arts and another one, you know, to, to see these great locales. These uh, beautiful sceneries of the farm, of the farming activity, look at these yellow green patches, um, which is uh, the way how the logo is going to work. And then another lookout, we're going to get to see the little village of Tarai. This is the Urubamba River here. And as uh, 
it's quite typical, you know, especially in the rainy season. It is, uh, it is a blue sky in the dry season. Well, afterwards, we're going to hit the market of PSAC. The market is kind of uh, late in the afternoon, but it's uh, usually a quite busy market where P, where the locals are gonna, where locals are going to bring a lot of, of their crops from their communities. There's over like uh, 14 different communities in the surroundings of this colonial town, and they come here to sell or even to trade wherever they have back at their farms. If we're lucky enough, we can actually hit, you know, at the time where uh, this uh, law, these indigenous communities are attending this Catholic church service, and they actually come with their beautiful woven, you know, outfits. You see the ladies here, this concentration of these ladies. But look at the detail, uh, geometrical figures on their, on their shells, just the same way how these men are wearing these ponchos with all this beautiful, uh, this uh, beautiful weaving that was that actually was made by the females. But this is what we're gonna we're gonna get to see. When I tell you about the Inca, this is part of that Inca architecture, a part of the in engineering. Um, you have all these vertical uh, terraces and that kind of a, a vertical management of these. Of the soils that have forced them to use the slope of the mountains and in, or, in order to avoid the erosion they were forced to make these terraces in anywhere they could actually uh, set it up and also they had long residential areas like in this case and on temples this is just uh, this is uh, the remain of a temple um, like a look at these structures trapezoid trapezoidal shapes, um, the four walls leaning to each other. Well, the only thing are missing are a few stones to eventually have the touch roof. Uh, the quality of the stone work is really fine, as you see. And um, after visiting all these places, we're gonna go to some of the, well, to one of the accommodations, a place called Inca Terra, and this is the reception area, and this is what they look, the rooms look like. And, uh, uh, then we're going to have to also enjoy part of the culinary arts we have. I'm showing you these uh, dishes in order like to see what is the presentation of our meals. This is the first course, the second and the third course. Sometimes we, we actually go with a glass of pisco sour. Next day, day three, we're going to be going to Chinchero. And in Chinchero, we have actually a monumental site. There's actually this uh, colonial church, which is uh, which um, was built back in the 1600s, and the Incas had established all this area. This area that you see, these niches are Inca. So what the, the Spanish have done was to destroy the Inca temple and set up this colonial church right on top. We have uh, very monumental staircases leading to the top of these pyramids, and. Uh, this is what we see in the back side of, of Chinchero, or the series of these beautiful terraces that were used as experimental labs for the different kind of varieties of tours that they used to go. This is, we're gonna be passing by the Urubamba River. Look, this is what it looks like in the dry season. And this is what it looks like in the wet season. Green and brown in the wet season. We have uh, some birds um, by the riverside. But also we we have birds on the on the, on the mainland. Then after Chinchero, we're going to visit Morai and look. Morai actually was built in a natural depression. Perhaps it might even be the an extinct crater that they, the Incas they have seen as very convenient because it would actually be concentration of hum of humidity in the area. But this was not the only depression. If you see here. This is the one that I'm just showing you here, and this one, and there was another one, and, and a third, and a fourth one is around here. So four of these circular giant, um, giant um, terraces, which were made with the only purpose to overproduce food that needed to be stored in, in constructions up above uh, the mountains. 
And this is picnic lunch, by the way. This is the kind of vehicles that we use. This is the kitchen. And here we have our uh, menu room. This is where we actually uh, don't dine. We actually have lunch in this place. We can have like a bottle of wine. And then uh, through the, the, the area we're passing by with the vehicle, especially, we get to see, you know, a lot of different kind of birds, like at this Muscovy duck, or like at the Puna ibis, or like at this Indian flicker. We have also egrets, so we have the tiger heron, usually this is by the river, and the angals, or we also have the mountain caracara. And then eventually, once we do, you know, after lunch, we're going to be visiting this, this place called Maras. This is actually a repository of different kind of uh, uh, pools, shallow pools, and there are, uh, that has like a salty water. And then when it gets dried by the sun, it gets uh, it gets a lot of this uh, crystals of salt, which is used for the local consumption. This is in the dry season, and this is in the wet season. The rain starts to wash it out, but of these little you know pools, we have over 2,500 of them. Uh, set up right in this creek of this uh, of this uh, valley. Down here is the Urubamba Valley. This is higher up. It's, uh, it's kind of like a the plateau of Cusco. Some trails uh, later in the afternoon. We can actually do some of this uh, some of these beautiful trails uh, in between of the farmland, uh, where we can get to see some water channels. It's, it's very interesting to see how they grow, how they grow uh, crops, especially corn or different other vegetables. And then next day we're going to be going to Ollanta y Tambo. Basically, we're just going to pass by. Although uh, we're going to do a, we're going to do a, a very short you know, tour in order like, to visit this living museum, the village of Ollanta y Tambo. Uh, they still, you know. Uh, people, the natives and the mestizo people are still using some of these houses. But this, uh, look at these water channels, they are still active, four of them in the village. Now we're going to get to see this whole view. Um, it shows you again the series of terraces and the architecture of the area. Uh, just later, after the, the tour that we do, we're going to be catching the train towards Machu Picchu. This is what you see. This is actually, this area is the Urubamba Canyon. And so we're going to be riding through this valley. This train ride was declared to be one of the most beautiful um, train rides of the world. Obviously, starting in Oriente Tambo, it looks, uh, it looks less green. But as we, as we go um, through, it gets really this green. And to eventually get, you know, this, uh, um, constant greenery, you know, especially on the area of Machu Picchu. This is what we see from the from the window of the train. This is some petrels. We have some ducks, touring ducks, and some cormorants. It's quite fun to do this ride. And then once uh, we do the Urubamba Canyon, we get into the town of Machu Picchu. Um, this is going to be our one of our restaurants. Um, in the village of Machu Picchu town, on El Machu Picchu. And then we'll be taking a bus to go to the archaeological site of Machu Picchu. There we go with Machu Picchu. Look at this couple of mountains, especially this one. This is so outstanding. To get to this little one. So we will visit Machu Picchu. I'm going to show you the most important sites. This is the Temple of the Sun. Look at this beautiful combination of this natural rock formation. And they had adapted it to make this semicircular structure with very symmetrical rocks. Uh, possibly at one time, this was decorated with lamins of gold. When you come over here, I'm going to show you and tell you the whole history of it. And this actually is representing the house of the Inca, of the main leader of this uh, Inca province. It is just like any a model of a regular uh, home compound, uh, having a reception, having a living room, a little patio and a bedroom, uh, and then a passageway to go in the backside of the area. We have some temples, 
that were damaged through the century, but this is what Hiram Bingham actually found in 1912. It was the same way and it's still the same way as it was. We have another temple just on the right hand side of this area. This is the outside part of that temple, the temple of the three windows. And then we have different terraces and trails to go to some other important areas, like for instance this. These are called astronomical mirrors. It needs to have water in order to do astronomical observations, especially of the modern world. Interesting to look at this couple of natural rocks were found and adapted to represent the wings of a condor. Uh, if you see here, this, uh, this one and the other wing, but look, this very rock was removed from somewhere else in order to carve the neck of that condor. Look at the head of this condor right here. And this is a white feather color that has around its neck. You can easily tell, you, you don't have to match. So the head, in the middle of these two large uh, wings. What else do we see in Machu Picchu? Machu Picchu, it is a, uh, it's what we call a historical uh, sanctuary uh, of Machu Picchu. It has about 89,000 acres, where there's a lot of different kind of archaeological sites. But uh, through the trails, right just before you get into the Inca site of Machu Picchu, this is what we see. Some of these um, beautiful orchids, like Epidendros, Mas de Valles, look at this. Very, these are, this is a very endemic you know, orchid of Machu Picchu. I will tell you a story when you come down here. And then this Sobralia de Cotoma, a beautiful orchid again, really like a, a little bit more like a bamboo, bamboo plant. It's really big, tall. Another of this uh, orchid, more of these flowers also that we're gonna get to see. And this is the accommodation for that night. Look at the rooms, and the rustic style, beautiful uh, area, the, the background of the, the grounds of the hotel. Actually has uh, uh, areas where are concentrated concentration of these beautiful birds. This is the Andean cock of the rock, the male, and this is the female. Would you believe this little uh, female and in Coco the Rock. That's is very attractive to at least uh, not just one, maybe four, five, even ten. It's doing a dance to call the attention of this female. Once this female catches the attention of one of these males through the mating ritual dance, then it's going to go together with him and it's going to go and, uh, for about a month in a couple of weeks and a month to actually do the nesting and eventually the male is going to take off and the female is going to take in, it's going to take care of his chicks. Uh, this is actually uh, the symbol, the, the bird symbolism of Peru, the Andean cock of the rock, Rupicula peruvianis. And we also have the chance to see in the grounds of the hotel the Andean moth moth, sorghums and some of these little sparrows that are very common, we see them all over. We have uh, uh, day, day five. Day five, uh, this is optional, by the way, although quite fun uh, to do a hike. This is the, the name of this mountain, the classic mountain that you see in the pictures. It's called Huayna Pichu. And uh, there's a kind of a vertical trail that goes where the arrow is going, just like this, to get to these terraces, eventually go around the top of the mountain, get to the very top of the mountain of Huayna Picchu and have a great you know, view of the whole Machu Picchu site. Uh, we do have other options too that we can do a short hike, which actually just takes 20 minutes, this little one. It's called Uña Huayna Picchu. So this is quite fun. It's a vertical staircase. And compared to this, it would be actually even, it is shorter of course, but um, uh, very steep. Over here, it is zigzagging but it's really fun because this is when you get to see the, the flowers that I've shown you before, and even some of these birds. This is where we see all this, all these uh, orchids, especially this, and uh, the, uh, some, of the, some of the birds too, not this one, this one's here. 
And then uh, there's other options also to do hikes. Sometimes there's too many people going up to the top of the mountain. And then uh, we can also have perhaps the choice of going uh, of going to the top of uh, Machu Picchu mountain and uh, some good chances uh, of uh, seeing you know insects like this, uh, spiders, beautiful spiders like this. And even, you know, the flight of uh, condors that from time to time, they come around Machu Picchu. It's been seen as spectacle bears and also a neon fox. This is a little bit about the fauna of, and also the flora that you get to see right on the trails. This is actually a flower of a bromelia. This is in the family of the birth of paradise, but right, you know, the wild version all along the trails of much beach. That very afternoon, we're gonna go back to Cusco. Now we're gonna hit you know, the hotel. This is the hotel in Cusco. This is the reception area. And then uh, day, day six, it's gonna be, uh, we stay one full, uh, almost a whole day in Cusco. And then we will visit one of the most important monumental sites of the Inca construction. What's the Inca construction? This red terrace and the gray one. This is already colonial. This is a Spanish, this is a Catholic church. But although it shows you the whole combination, you know, of the uh, Buscanian architecture. Now. This is what we see inside the Temple of the Sun. This is a perfect, you know, uh, constructions, trapezoidal doorways, precise, uh, precise uh, paths and the stones and that trapezoidal shape, typical of the Inca constructions. Then we're gonna visit also Sacsayhuaman. Sacsayhuaman is a monumental site. This is where we're gonna to get to see the giant rocks. And some of them, they go over 100 to 150 and the heaviest happens to be 200 tons. So we're gonna be visiting that and get to walk around to appreciate the stone construction. Interestingly, just like how the women used to weave with yarn, the men used to weave with, with stones. This is actually a, the, the print of a puma pig. Look, this is the wrist, the four toes around here, just like in this sign here. So this is not imagination. Actually, they did it in purpose. Here, you probably don't notice that much, but this is the head of a snake right here. Look, the head of a snake. So that's what the men have woven with rocks, very precise, seamless, you know, junctions, but this pillow shape, you know, um, carving uh, around, you know, each rock, it gives that beautiful soft look. But this is still rough. It's not as precise as the one, as the stones that we saw in the previous picture of the, of the, of the Temple of the Sun. And this is the thing next after the visit of Saxewan, we're gonna visit the cathedral. And look at this is a massive church. So it's the cathedral, it has three different bodies. We're gonna this is part also of the main square. You probably see that flag, the rainbow flag, which is the new version of the Inca flag. And this is what we get to see inside. We have this chapel, about 1800 pounds of silver, and right in this altar. We'll tell you the the history inside there, and also this beautiful painting made by a by a Cuscanian, by a local painter. And as you can see, this is a the version, the Cuscanian version of the Last Supper. You have uh, Jesus; he's being offered a yeah, roasted guinea pig on a tray. And of course, the different apostles. Jesus is already crucified here, so this is what we're going to get to see the cathedral and many other religious paintings. And of course, for instance, this interesting and very attractive chapel that holds this Jesus statue, but this skin is black. There's a very grammatical procession that happens to be um, right at the main square. And this is the way how it's ordinated with like a red flowers. And this is this kind of a concentration of people. It's, it's nothing compared to what happens during the night where there's like over 50,000 people gather at the main square. Well, if you're coming more or less by March, you would be able to witness this procession. This is just 
a very amusing sight when we go to the restaurants. Somebody have taken this picture, showing the sign to the water closet. Men to the left, because women are always right. And then we're gonna have a farewell lunch. Look at the kind of beautiful um, salads that we have, the main meal, and then we have dessert. Uh, this is what we offer in the whole trip. So besides that, just to finish up with the whole presentation, uh, we also do some social projection work. Uh, always on the have of not have, we're actually here gathering and trying to remember the knowledge of the locals, of the elderly people, but also sharing with the, with the children. Uh, here I am uh, teaching some of these children the same things that I'm teaching you, it's mostly about the flora and the fauna that are found in some of the, some of the local trails that we have in Cusco. Thank you very much for attending to this uh, presentation. See you soon in Peru and just get in contact with the not have a representative to get you to get you you know the whole information to come to this legendary country Peru. See you in Cusco. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Rosa. Now, before we start with the question and answer session, I would like to remind yes. everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. All right, let's get to some of these questions. So is there a best time to come and visit Machu Picchu? I would say the best time would be the dry season, although the whole year happens to be in a very good time. Why? Because in the rainy season, you get to see a lot of all these beautiful pictures that I've shown you. In the dry season, you get to see the birds. So whichever time you come in, it's going to be always good. And you're going to enjoy the same way because they are different in our sceneries, just green and dry. Great. Thank you for that. Can tourists visit Caral? Oh yeah, yes, there are actually tours to Caral. Uh, Caral uh, City happens to be 200 kilometers away from Lima. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's easy to organize one of those trips. Uh, I think a natural habitat cannot organize it easily. Um, it's a whole day trip. Very interesting to see how the archaeologists are still working in 26 of these pyramids around Caral. Great, thank you for that answer. So now if I'm coming there on a trip, is it going to take me some time to get acclimated to the uh, to the altitude there, 10,000 feet? Yes. In fact, what we do, as soon as you hit Cusco, uh, we get in the vehicle. Uh, we don't even take like a couple of hours before we hit the lower altitude. Cusco being, you know, at uh, over 10,000 feet, uh, we, after two hours, we're getting into 9,000 feet. So under 10,000, the altitude symptoms is not, it, people don't even feel it, by the way. So it's just a couple of hours, but uh, people don't, don't feel any kind of symptoms at all. Great, thank you. So how much time will we actually spend at Machu Picchu? Machu Picchu has actually a couple of days. We have uh, day fifth and day six. So the first day, we're actually walking through the archaeological site. And uh, the second day, we're hiking you know, uh, towards the mountains. And that's where we have plenty of time to enjoy uh, Machu Picchu area. So you mentioned a glass of Piso sour that you got to take it with you. Is, is that something yes. you could describe for us? <laughs> oh yeah, of course, yes. Uh, pisco is actually made out of uh, of grapes. It's like a brandy, and it is used um, to make what we call pisco sours. Uh, it is uh, this uh, pisco, a shot of a pisco, with the white of the eggs and uh, with some syrup and then lemon juice. Put it in the blender it makes a very foamy beverage it's really tasty it tastes like a margarita some people actually told me oh very interesting you know. 
Yes, and you know, by the coast, the southern part of the coast, there's a lot of uh, vineyards. That's where they actually produce this disco, you know, beverage. Great, thank you for that. So you showed us a bunch of uh, lovely ancient artifacts earlier in the presentation. Are those in a museum, and are we going to be able to see some of those? Uh, yes, whenever we have time in Cusco, sometimes we're kind of like a little packed with the different activities that we do. But uh, I always find uh, ways to, you know, to show you a little museum where we can get to some of these uh, ceramics, at least to have an idea. Cusco has a lot of museums, so we got the chance, we do it and we'll show you uh, some of these uh, artifacts. Great, thank you. Now let's get back to the uh the uh, climate uh, elevation again uh getting acclimated to the climate again are there yes. things that we can do before we come on the trip to get acclimated or are there things that we can do if we are experiencing symptoms i think the only the only thing is like to get into hikes and uh, to get uh, the most exercises that you can um, like a walking uh, through trails that have steps that will actually help you a lot because as I'm telling you, like a people, our guests, when they get to Cusco, they don't feel at all. Except when we go to Chinchero next day, just a little bit, maybe like a mild, uh, uh, basically dryness. They feel the dry air. But otherwise, the acclimation is very easy because we spend like a couple of nights in, uh, in the Urubamba Valley. And the next day, we dropping down to Machu Picchu, which is about 6,000 feet. And then we get to the archeological site is 8,400. So we basically under 10,000, under 9,000, uh, most of the uh, trip. And our last day is when we get back to Cusco. And that's just like uh, one night and one uh, full, you know, one full day. Great, thank you for addressing that, Rosa. Unfortunately, that will be the last question that we do have time for today. So I'd like to hand it back to you for any closing comments you may have for us. Well, uh, thank you very much. And just uh, uh, thank you for your patience of my broken English. Uh, as I was telling Rob, I'm not used to talk to the screen. In general, we talk face to face and that gets me a little nervous. So please, uh, or gave me some of the different kind of uh, mistakes that I might have done. Although, although I'll be waiting for you when you come to Cusco. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Rosa, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. Now, if you are interested in information on how you could travel with NatHab, please give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.